Hey everybody, welcome to Sandals Church. My name is Vivi Diaz and I am your online host. And I just wanna say welcome because here at Sandals Church, we are all about this vision of being real. And something we are so excited about is that this vision of being real isn't just for the adults in the room, but if you have kids or maybe you're just a big kid at heart, I would love to invite you to check out our brand new Sandals Church experience for kids at sandalskids.tv. So make sure to check that out because we're so excited and we're also so excited that you chose to join us today. So enjoy the message and have a great day. What's going on, everybody? Hello, hello, it's good to be with you today. <clears throat> As we get to uh, wrap up this series, Motivated, I hope you guys have been enjoying this series so far, because over the last several weeks, man, our desire has been to ask God to give us a motivation for his word, because we want to experience a better life. We want to experience the life that we know we can live, the life that God has designed for us, but we know it's gotta happen as we are finding ourselves listening to God and his word. And that's actually our topic today, how we actually listen to God. Because it's not possible for you and I to continue to be in his word, to be motivated to read his word, and not be listening to him as well. Now, I don't know about you, but I learned at a very young age that I was a terrible listener. I got this memory from when I was in the third grade. I'm in the classroom, sitting there, and the teacher is up front doing her thing. And at one point, she just stops, and she says, Alfredo? Are you listening to me? Now, of course, as a third grader, I'm just kind of frozen, stuck, staring at her. And she's like, I don't think you're listening to me because you're talking, and that's all you've been doing. Now, of course, in my third grade response, I'm like, well, every other kid's talking too? And she says, yeah, but I could only hear your voice. Your voice seems to be carrying across the whole classroom. Now, as a third grader, you don't know really what that means, and so I'm just kind of staring at her, like embarrassed, like, man. And then she tries to turn it into like a positive thing. She's like, well, you know what? Maybe the Lord will use that loud voice of yours and make you a preacher one day. <laughs> Look at me now. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> but you know, as a third grader, you're not excited to hear that, <laughs> even if it's true. I don't wanna be a preacher. But y'all, y'all know this too, though. Like, listening is incredibly difficult. I'm sure at some point in your life, you guys have been asked, are you actually listening to me by someone? And companies are really even fascinated by this because it actually costs them a lot of money. There was a survey recently done that, that captured the, the top 400 companies in, in the U.S. and the U.K., and they discovered that they spend more than 60 extra million dollars because their employees don't listen to them. That's, that's a lot. Not listening will cost you a lot. And we really know this on a human level. Not listening will cost you friendships, can cost you a marriage, can cost you a life. Now, if that's true on our scale, how much more true is that when it comes to you and I trying to relate to God? Not listening to God can cost us far more than we can possibly imagine. And so our psalm today from Psalm 19 that we're gonna read is all about the ways that God speaks to us and how you and I can be listening to him and how that can actually drastically change our life. And so let's read together from Psalm 19, and then I'll pray for us. David writes this, starting there in verse one. The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day they continue to speak. Night after night they make him known. They speak without a sound or word. Their voice is never heard. Yet their message has gone throughout the earth and their words to all the world. God has made a home in the heavens for the sun. It bursts forth like a radiant bridegroom after his wedding. It rejoices like a great athlete eager to run the race. The sun rises at one end of the heavens and it follows its course to the other end. 
Nothing can hide from its heat. The instructions of the Lord are perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The commandments of the Lord are right, bringing joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are clear, giving insight for living. Reverence for the Lord is pure, lasting forever. The laws of the Lord are true, each one is fair. They are more desirable than gold, even the finest gold. They are sweeter than honey, even honey dripping from the comb. They are a warning to your servant, a great reward for those who obey them. How can I know all the sins lurking in my heart? Cleanse me from these hidden faults. Keep your servant from deliberate sins. Don't let them control me. Then I will be free of guilt and innocent of great sin. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for your word. And we, God, collectively right now are all here. And we know that you are here too. And so we ask, God, that you would speak to us and you would make us the kind of people who can listen to you, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. A number of years ago, I took uh, my family on a vacation. We went to Hawaii, kind of broke the bank for this one. And the reason I was doing that is because we were celebrating all of their birthdays. You see, my, my whole family, my wife and my two children are born, celebrate birthdays within one week of each other. So Ashley and my son Eli, both, both born on Halloween. I grew up not a fan of Halloween. Now I gotta like Halloween, and I do. And then our daughter Ella came on November 5th. So within seven days, we got three birthdays. So as you can imagine, the fall is expensive. So be praying for me every fall. Like, man, that, that pastor has got a lot. But this year, we decided to go to Hawaii. We stayed on the island of Kauai. They call it the Garden Island. It's natural, it's beautiful, there's tons of things to see. And one day we took this drive to Waimea Canyon. Now if you don't know about Waimea Canyon, it, it's called the Grand Canyon of the Pacific. And that's essentially what it is. It's like the Grand Canyon just plopped right onto the Hawaiian Islands. And listen to me, it's gorgeous. This place is lush, it's green, there's waterfalls. It's not even hard to get to, and when we got up to the viewing platform, man, I, Ashley and I, we, we just froze. We were stunned at what we were seeing. And in the best possible way, I felt so small because I was in the presence of something so incredible, so awe-inspiring. And, and I know you guys have had these kinds of moments too in your own life, where you're just moved by nature. And I'm, I'm having this moment, and then off to my left, I see this dude. He's holding a spear and he's got a big horn in his hand and he's not wearing a lot of clothes. Turns out he's a local, born and raised Hawaiian and he goes up there every day that there's tourists there and he actually teaches us about the Waimea Canyon. His ancestors lived in and around the canyon and so he goes up there, gives these facts but you gotta, you gotta understand now, he's dressed like his ancestors too. So he's got like plants and leaves kind of just covering his parts and so I'm up there having this moment with God and with nature, and then the thought hits me. If we catch a wind up here, <laughs> we're gonna see a lot more than the Waimea Canyon. <laughs> but you see, th this moment was so surreal and sweet, why? Because of what Psalm 19 is telling us. The heavens declare the glory of God. The world, the created world, in other words, is speaking to us. God is communicating through his creation, telling something to us that is so powerful. But yet, as the psalm says, there's no words, which is why if you're taking note, write this down. Listening to God isn't just with my ears, but with my whole self. Not just with ears, but with my whole self. Because you'll notice there, it says in verse three and four, they speak without a sound or word. Their voice is never heard, yet their message has gone throughout the earth and their words to all the world. Now, how's that possible? Their words have gone to all the world, yet there are no words. The psalm is referring to nonverbal communication. Right? So nonverbally, God is communicating through his created world to you and I. Through the stars, God is speaking. 
Through the oceans, God is speaking. Through the snow-capped mountains, God is speaking to us. From a reef shark swimming to a toucan flying, God is speaking. From the bacteria on your skin to, to the largest like beluga whale just swimming around somewhere, God is speaking. The atoms, tiniest atoms in the universe that fill it to, to that large ball, ball of gas that we got called the sun, God is speaking to us every day through his created world. Are we listening to him though? Can you hear him speak? Because he is communicating something wonderful to us. And what he says every day to every person everywhere is that you are meaningful and your life is charged with purpose and design and artistry and you belong to your creator. Psalm 19 says, everybody hears this from God. But the question is, are we listening to that? Because I, I don't know where maybe you are at right now and what kind of season you find yourself in. Maybe you think God isn't speaking. Maybe you kind of feel like God's been absent. But I would, I would just encourage you, in light of what we just heard, maybe God's not been absent, you've been absent. Because one detail I kind of left out about visiting Waimea Canyon is that every single one of us had our phones out, <laughs> taking video, taking a picture. And of course, that's great, man. You want a memory. You want to be reminded of, of your trip there. But I wonder what our lives would look like if everyone up there on that viewing platform had just put their phones away long enough just to listen to God, to, to soak in nature and to be moved by it just for a moment. Because it does change you. Nonverbal communication, we know it can be very powerful, but at the same time, it can be confusing. We, we use it a lot with each other, right? And oftentimes, we're, we're not sure what kind of messages we're sending to each other. And nature does the same thing. Sometimes you see things in the natural world that you're like, I don't know what that means. Two animals eating each other, tornadoes, right? The message isn't always clear. And we know this even from our own relationships. My first date with Ashley, I, I, I learned this very well, because the date, the whole day was actually a complete accident. <laughs> It was never supposed to happen. What was supposed to happen is that I was gonna go with a group of friends, she was involved, to Disneyland. But then one by one, every single friend dropped out. So it's just me and this girl that I really like, but I don't want her to know yet that I like her. And she's in my car, and it's just us, sitting there, awkwardly silent. And when we, we love to get along with each other, we talk a lot, but in that moment, this just felt awkward. So there's a lot of nonverbal communication going on. I'm sitting there driving like, man, is this a date? <laughs> Does she think this is a date? Like, should I act like this is a date? We're going to Disneyland. Does that mean I'm gonna pay for everything like it's a date? <laughs> That's gonna be a problem. <laughs> like a single word in the moment would have just saved us. Like, hey, that churl's on you today, I'm sorry. <laughs> that would have helped us a whole ton which is why the psalm continues and says, not only does God speak non-verbally through his created world, but he speaks with his written word as well. Look right there in the middle of the passage. It says, the instructions of the Lord are perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees, they're trustworthy. They make wise the simple, it says. In other words, they turn fools into wise men. The commandments of the Lord are right. In other words, they are the standard. They bring joy to the heart. The commands are clear, they give insight for living. They show us the path to life. And all that the psalm is saying is that this is what the word is, it is the standard, it is perfect, it is enough. And then it does something to its hearer. It's changing us. Which means then for us to consider secondly, listening to God isn't just for information, but transformation. It's not just for information, but transformation. Now, I think at a bottom line, you guys, we, we kind of know this though, right? Like, you don't wanna just read the Bible to be just filled with knowledge, filled with information. In fact, you probably know, and it's not hard to find people in your life who know a lot about the Bible. They can give you a lot of Bible verses, but they don't seem to be very kind. They don't seem to be very loving. It's like, what are you doing with all that knowledge, dude? It doesn't seem to really play itself out in your life. In like fact, maybe you even came from a place, either in the home or a previous church, where you saw people use a verse to comfort themselves, but then try to control and manipulate you. That happens. That's dangerous. 
That's reading just for information and knowledge and some sort of power you think you have with the scriptures. But this psalm is saying, no, it does something to you. You don't necessarily master the Bible. The, mas- the, the Bible actually begins to master you and shape and change you. But then you also have this other category of people, man, they just, they have great reverence for the Bible. They love it, they enjoy it. They love to go to Bible studies. They love to discover all the different languages it was written in and where and the dates and the times and they're just so fascinated and they love it, right? And I can nerd out with the best of them. But again, it, it doesn't seem to really change their life. They might have all the right intentions for learning, but again, it doesn't really transform them. They're reading simply to be informed. And there's a place in the Psalms, not Psalm 19, but Psalm 119, if you're familiar with it, it's the longest Psalm in the entire book, 176 verses long. And some of those most well-known verses from that passage says this, the word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. But someone who's just informed by the Bible, imagine for a second, is like someone on a path who's just staring at their light. Like, look at this light. Look how bright it is. I'm fascinated with this light. And you kind of come up to them, and instead of walking on the path, they're just kind of on the side, side of the road, not using it, but just staring at it, fascinated with it. Like, look at this light. Look how amazing this is. Man, what a light. I could just look at this for days. That's all I want to do. I just want to look at this light. And it's like, man, use it. Use it. Let it light your path. Let it guide you along this journey of life. That is actually what we're after when it comes to reading. We wanna move beyond just being informed. But you see, all of us though would be a little foolish to think we're not at some point like this. Because we, we live in what many people call the digital world now, which means everything is at our fingertips. Movies, shows, the best of the information out there you can get in a second. Like you need five ways to sleep right now? I'll look it up. Watch you get eight hours tonight. (laughs) Oh, you you want an article on Instagram, someone's blog post with a great picture, seven things to start doing today to make your life amazing, and you amazing too. Oh yeah, I'll read through that. Like we can get so much information today, and we do, we gather data, we, we learn things, and I don't know if it's actually changing any of us. We're just accruing information and knowledge, and I don't know if it's leading to any kind of real transformation. But what it is doing is starting to retrain our brains so that we actually start to read as fast as we can scroll on a screen. And we're just skimming the surface, kind of reading in this line, hoping to to gain some kind of knowledge because we think with that knowledge will give us some kind of power how to control our lives. And when you approach the Bible that way, you are left like that man on the path just staring at the light, not actually being changed. We need to move from just being informed. And here's how you know you're starting to move. Because you don't just ask like, how much should I read? But how should I read? How should I read? You see, learning to listen to God is not a technique, it's an attitude. How are you approaching the scriptures? How are you asking God to speak? And this is even true as we work through our 60 days together journeying through the word. Man, I, I know it, it's on the app and I love to scroll all the way to the bottom, find that little blue button, marked as completed. Boom, the little rocket ship pops up. You're like, wow, love my church, man. This is awesome and it's great. It's fantastic. But how? How are you reading? Not how much. Allow it to change you. Allow it to transform you. Notice what it says there in verse seven. The instructions of the Lord are perfect reviving the soul. Circle that word soul. In Hebrew, that means your psyche. Your psyche, it revives your psyche. In other words, it restores a sense of who you truly are. In other words, the psalmist is saying the scriptures have the power to tell you who you truly are. They have the power to restore your identity. And they have the power to make you the kind of person you need to become. And in a world in which we are told every day, based on our failures and our successes, who we are, the Bible says no to all of it. This is who you truly are. This is who you truly are. Listening to God will give you your true identity beyond everything else. 
that is alone a motivation to wanna hear from him, to wanna be in his word, to want to learn to listen to him because you and I, deep down inside, need to know who we actually are. And that's true in here if you're a Christian or a non-Christian. The scriptures alone have the power to reveal who you are. Now Paul, a New Testament writer, picks up this idea. It's there in your notes from 2 Timothy 3. He says all scripture is inspired by God. In other words, all of it originates from him and it's profitable. In other words, it's useful. It's good for teaching, showing us life. It's good for rebuking, he says, telling us when we're out of line, for correcting, showing us how to get back on the path. And then notice as he continues, for training in righteousness, and then here's the part you really need to pay attention to. So that, that's the goal, the man or woman of God may be what? Complete, complete, equipped for every good work. That word complete means whole or the ideal version. What, an, what, what a picture God gives to us. He gives to us his word so that you and I, as men and women, would become the ideal version of ourselves as we come to know him and know who we actually are. Which means the best version of you is the you that is shaped by God's word as you listen to him. That's what the Bible is telling us. And that will begin to revive you, open you up. Now what's so interesting about this process, as the Psalm continues, David says something very interesting. You might have caught it too. He says, this is more valuable than gold, even the finest gold. In other words, financial security cannot do for me what the word is doing for me. And he says, even physical pleasures like dessert, it's sweeter than honey. In other words, it gives him an experience that is better than what the world offers. But then he says at the same time, how can I know all my hidden faults? It's a rhetorical question, he can't. So this same word that is so sweet and, and rich is also painful at times. It challenges him at times. It convicts him at times. It leads him to a place where he says, cleanse me from my sins and keep me from deliberate ones. Right? Interesting enough, the same scripture that you will find sweet, you at times will also find painful. And that is good. That's important. Because notice how David addresses God at the very end there. Circle that word, redeemer. He calls him his redeemer right there at the very end of the passage. Now, I don't know if David knew this, but when he addressed God as redeemer, he was actually speaking about his great, 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 great grandson, King Jesus, who in fact is the redeemer. And here's what I want us to notice. Thirdly, listening to God leads me to Jesus. Leads me to Jesus. When you think about it, when Jesus came to the earth, he was a teacher. Teacher of what? The scriptures. Man, Jesus knew the Bible. He read the Bible. He listened to God. Man, if there was any human that knew how to listen to God every day, Jesus did. And he loved to teach it. He loved to share it. He even, he even enjoyed sometimes at moments correcting people who wrongly interpreted it. He would go after those who would try to weaponize the Bible and use it against other people. He went after them the hardest. Right? Oh, you're a Bible nerd? Let's see. Because he constantly said, have you ever read? Haven't you heard? Don't you know that this is what it says? Right? He's constantly correcting our interpretations of what we think God's word says. And in one conversation with some of the religious leaders now, these are conservative religious leaders, listen to what Jesus says. It's there in your notes from John chapter five. You search the scriptures. Bam, you know what that means for me in my private school? I get a gold star that day. You know your Bible. But look what he goes on to say. Because you think they give you eternal life, but the scriptures point to me, yet you refuse to come to me to receive this life. Wow. In Jesus' mind, the entire Bible is not like how maybe some of us think of it as, this kind of disconnected, like all these different stories with kind of like a nice little moral point at the end, like, oh, don't have an affair like David did, or tell the truth so you don't get like, you know, a body part missing. That's not how Jesus reads the Bible. 
He reads the Bible as this continuous, unified story, which begins in Genesis by saying, in the beginning, God, and then it ends in Revelation with him saying, again, I will come to you soon. And he says, this story, all of scripture is ultimately about me, Jesus says. It all points to him. So when David calls him his redeemer, then it frees us up to actually view the Bible in a much different way. It's not ultimately about you. And oftentimes, man, sometimes we go to the Bible like that, don't we? Like we read a passage and then we think, okay, what's the point? All right, I'm gonna try to live that out. And if you do that over time, let me be, just be very honest with you, it will crush you. It will crush you. you. You will feel constantly weighed down by all the things that you cannot do right. But if you begin to see that the Bible is ultimately a story about a savior who has already obeyed all the commands you're told to obey and has already fulfilled, as he said, all the commands you're told to obey, in order to save you and love you, it radically changes the way you read the Bible. So then, when you approach the Bible, you're, you're not going to it thinking to myself, okay, I gotta obey this command in order to be saved. No, I obey this command because I am saved. I approach the Bible trying to obey this, thinking about how to live it out in my life, not because I'm trying to earn God's favor or earn God's love, no, because I already have his love. And so I approach the Bible desiring to listen to God, not as like a boss would like, all right, here's today's chart, get this done. No. I approach the Bible hearing God, not as a boss, but as a father, coming to tell me who I am first and foremost. I'm loved, I'm saved, I'm secured. I have a home, I have a name, and now you've called me to do this. It's a fundamentally different way to approach listening to God as you read the scriptures. And that's what we're invited to do. Now at this point, I wanna be real honest with some of you guys, because there are places in the Bible where you read a story and you're like, that did not revive my soul. Uh, that did not bring any kind of joy to my heart. In fact, that weird kind of account of wherever that is in the Song of Solomon's, Talking about romance and stuff, that did not give me any insight for living right now. There are times where it's like that. Let me be very honest. There are times <clears throat> when the Bible is, yes, very boring. There are times when the Bible is complex and difficult to understand and, and the meaning isn't clear. But you know what? When you think about it, so is your life. It's okay, you can admit it. Sometimes your life is boring. Sometimes your life is unclear, your life is very complex, your life doesn't always make sense, it's difficult to understand. Sometimes things happen and there's no point and you're like, what does this even mean? Right? And so when you really think about it, the Bible in its complexity, in its boredom, in its difficulty reflects your life and my life. Because our, our lives don't live out like a Star Wars movie. Like good guy, bad guy, scene, scene, statement, love, victory. That's not how it goes. That is not how our lives play out. But because we're so used to gathering stuff like that, we almost become accustomed to expecting the Bible to do that too. I mean, there's, there's times where I just want an explicit answer. God, would you just make it real clear? And he doesn't. But that doesn't mean that you should stop listening. Press into it even more. Because as boring as it could be, as long as it could be, and as difficult as it can be, it still will revive your soul. It still will do it. And this is how. Lastly now, listening to God begins with meditating on scripture. Begins with meditating. David at the end of that Psalm said, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord which is a similar statement there from your notes in Psalm chapter one. But they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night, meditating. Now I know I already lost some of you. Like, man, you don't know my life, Pastor Fredo. I, I move at a pace, I got no time for meditation. Plus that doesn't even sound real Christian. <laughs> but consider for a moment this, meditation is simply your head thinking and at the same time your heart sensing and feeling. Meditation is your head and your heart 
having a conversation together. It's your head and your heart sharing a meal together, conversating together, going back and forth together. And when you really think about it, you and I meditate every single day. I'll show you. When you daydream, you're meditating. When you fantasize about your future or your sex life or things that you want and need, you're thinking and sensing something at the same time that's affecting you. How about this? When you worry, what are you doing? When you and I are worrying, we are thinking about something so hard that it becomes so real in our hearts that it actually affects the way we live. You know what that's called? Anxiety. <laughs> don't tell me you don't meditate. We all meditate. We all meditate every single day. And if we wanna listen to God, we need to begin to do that with his word. Thinking about his word in such a way that it becomes real in our hearts and almost like just sparks a fire and it affects the way you live. That's when you know you're being shaped. And here's how this can really look for all of you. Four R's. First one, as you approach the scriptures, first, recognize that God is there. Recognize that he's there. Man, I'm so surprised at how many times I forget that I'm reading God's word in front of God, in the presence of God. He's right there. Recognize that he's there. And set yourself up. Number two, read. Read out loud. Read out loud so that you can actually hear God's words audibly to you. For so many years, for thousands of years, the scriptures were read out loud for people, especially if they couldn't read for themselves. That's how they heard God's word. Read it out loud. Thirdly, reflect. Stop reading, pause, and just reflect. Reflect on something. Maybe something stood out to you. Maybe nothing stood out to you. Reflect on that. And then lastly, especially with us being a church that's about being real and authentic, you need to respond. Even if your response is, God, this was confusing, goodbye, I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> Click that blue button. You need to respond. God, I don't get it, I don't get it. Sit on that. Take that one thing with you. And, and, and here's how you know you're, you're moving into transformation as you meditate. You no longer look at the verses that you always underline. Go to the places where you never underline anything. Go to the passages in the Bible where you, you struggle to read. Something's gonna happen. And respond to God. Take that one thing with you. Use it throughout the day. Because here's the thing about meditation. Man, it's doing something to us and we never know it is. Until you're in that conversation with someone and they ask you that question and you're like, crap, man, it's a Bible question. Their, their life is a mess and they need my help. I don't know what I'm gonna say. And then you just kind of go for it. And then after you like spit something out, you're like, wow, that wasn't that bad. I didn't know that was in me. You didn't, but it was. Scripture's been shaping you. Something, something has sparked, right? That might even happen for you today as you were worshiping. Same song, same lyric, but for a, for a moment, man, it just, it felt so real to you, it affected your body. That's meditation. Change right there in the spot. And then this was Jesus too. This is how he lived his life. Man, if you poked Jesus, scripture would come out of him. He's in the wilderness. He's tempted 40 days, 40 nights, alone with God. Devil comes and tempts him three times. Every time he responds with what? A verse. One day, man does not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Now, as I read that, I ask myself, did Jesus read Deuteronomy that morning? I don't know if he did, but when he was tempted, that's what came out of him because it was forming him, it was shaping him in the same way it does to us. And it's oftentimes you don't even know what's happening, but it is happening. Because you know what? At the end of the day, listen to me now, every single one of you, man, your soul needs a fresh word from God. A fresh word from God that he is for you in Jesus and that he loves you. And so the invitation to listen is to receive that fresh word and to be changed by him, and molded by that situation, molded by that moment. It's amazing about the life of Jesus, man. He, not only did he read scripture, but in his moment of death, when he decides to surrender his life, he's on a cross. You know why he's on a cross? Because he's dying for people like you and me who don't listen to God. 
He's dying for people who don't listen when he is actually the Psalm 19 reader. In other words, he's done everything right. He's obeyed every command and he should be getting the reward, but instead he's getting the punishment. He's getting what you and I deserve for never listening to God. And in his moment of desperation and death, he cries out to God, why have you forsaken me? Why is this happening? And God gives him no word. Silence. The first time in the life of Jesus where he hears no word from the Father. Imagine that. Jesus dies in silence, not hearing a word from God so that you and I could live receiving a fresh word from God every day. That is the gospel. That is good news for you and I, you guys. And the beautiful thing about that is that offer stands for some of you today, for maybe for the first time, to hear a word from God that he loves you and your life can change as you give yourself to him and allow his word to shape you and mold you. And I know, man, some of you guys, your lives are in chaos, right? Like, it's a miracle you made it to church today for some of you. I get it. Man, you are balancing schedules, families, expectations, work life. Scripture and the Bible can just so easily be zapped out of your day. It happens to us. Man, it ha happened to me this week. My whole family, listen, y'all, we got the flu. And I'm talking about like the flu flu. Not like a, <clears throat> man, we were hurting. I had, I had fever, a chills. My body aches and the whole family, my wife went down too. First time in our lives, both of us got sick. And my kids too, they had the flu too. Man, one morning I woke up to the sound of my daughter throwing up. So I go to get her, I got a fever, I'm like shivering and holding her, trying to just comfort my two-year-old, like we're not gonna die, it's okay. Even though you feel like it. All the while this week I gotta prepare a message on listening to God. And I don't wanna listen to God. The only thing I wanna do is just lay in bed. And it got so bad Thursday night, I was so frustrated, like, man, God, how, how is this going to happen to me right now? I gotta teach on listening, and I don't wanna listen. I'm in my hallway at midnight, and I'm, I'm just struck. I think the Holy Spirit just came in so, so subtly and quietly and said, just come here. Just come here and listen. Sit down. Just listen to this word. And in that moment, I just had this kind of liberation where I could just, I was released and I, I just sat down and read, even in my frustration, even in my sickness, sweating off this fever, trying to take in God's word. I know your lives are a mess, but it's never a bad time to start listening to God. Even if you feel like you'll never be good at it, it's never a bad time to start listening to God. Young moms in here, you're balancing a lot, but still, come and listen. My friends who are in maybe their final season of life thinking God can't give you a fresh word, not true. Come, come and listen to God. Hear a word of love. Teenagers, some of y'all got too much time. You need to sit down and receive a fresh word from God. Young adults in here with too many decisions to make, this is one decision you can make. Come and listen. You workaholics in here, People where you feel like, man, you got no time for it, pause. Just pause and come and listen to a word from God. Friends, this is what your soul needs most, is a fresh word of love. And he calls us all right now to come and receive that. So let's do that together. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for your word. You didn't lead us astray. You gave us your word. And more importantly, you gave us your son, Jesus, as the word made flesh. Would you help us to be led to him? Would you help us to be transformed by what it is that we read and what it is that we hear? And God, I even thank you for this opportunity to be in community, to hear your word together. May it shape us and change us to be listeners. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Sandals Church is a nonprofit that operates from donations from people like you. Because when you donate, your money goes to helping us create places where people can be real. So to donate and be a part of how God moves for the vision of being real, make sure to go to donate.se to make a donation today. Have a great week.